Does anything we do ever amount to being anything more than just a brave gesture in a hostile world? I mean, I've written to my MP over a number of issues. I've marched against the poll tax, protested against nuclear weapons and demonstrated against the arms trade. I've spoken out against poverty, slept rough in aid of the homeless and I regularly donate items to the local food bank. I've reduced my use of plastic, recycled my bottles and cans, and I pay an ever-increasing amount for 100% renewable energy. I've given refuge to those who've needed a place of safety. I've stood alongside those who've needed to know that they're not alone. I've sat down with those who needed a shoulder to cry on. I've tried to do the right thing. I've tried to be a good person. I've tried to make the world a better place. But has anything I've done ever amounted to being anything more than just a brave gesture in a hostile world? As the tanks roll in across eastern Ukraine, as Covid continues to run rampant here and right across the world, and as our own lawmakers confess to their own lawlessness and then dissemble and cloak their sins before the presence of those they serve, as millions are plunged into poverty, as the NHS struggles to meet demand, as the mental health of our young people continues to cause concern, has anything we have ever done ever amounted to being anything more than just a brave gesture? in a hostile world. I mean, Jesus. Jesus Christ was a good man. He made sick people well. He restored sight to the blind. He made lepers clean. He talked about our need for forgiveness. He took pity on a woman caught having an illicit affair. He spoke about how God does not condemn us, but rather waits on, watches for, and then runs to those who've come to an end of themselves. Jesus made the outcast feel part of things again. He spent time with those that nobody else had time for, and he had compassion for those who were harassed and helpless. Jesus was a good, good man, but as adulation and praise turned to condemnation and calls to have him crucified, as this great preacher and teacher and healer and friend heaved his body up one last time to try and fill his lungs with air as the nails bit into his hands and the cross weighed heavy on his heart as this good man breathed his last did anything that he had done ever amount to being anything more than just a brave gesture in a hostile world That is the question that confronts us on Easter morning. Was that it? As the good they saw lay dead, as their hopes were entombed in stone, had religious bigotry and the clamour for power and the desire for a quieter life meant that that all had been so good had come to a shameful and bitter end? Had it all been just a brave gesture in a hostile world? Well, not according to the accounts that we have, of what came after Jesus' death. It's clear that something happened to the disciples between that dreadful Friday when the whole world had been shrouded in darkness and Pentecost Sunday, less than two months later, when the once demoralised followers of Jesus were defying the authorities that had once seemed so threatening and they were proclaiming that the one who died disgraced and forsaken had somehow made a way through death and out the other side. Paul was the first to put pen to paper, writing to the church in Corinth just 20 or so years after Jesus had died. This is what he says. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul talks about the teaching he had received. So it would seem that pretty soon after the death of Jesus, people were talking about resurrection. And whilst Mark's gospel appears to end in mystery and fear, Matthew writes of Jesus talking with the women 
and then meeting with the disciples in Galilee. Luke tells of two disciples heading to Emmaus. And in his second book, The Acts of the Apostles, Luke talks about all kinds of appearances stretching out over a period of 40 days. John, of course, tells us of that moving encounter with Mary Magdalene when she mistakes Jesus for the gardener. He writes of Jesus meeting the disciples without Thomas and then later with Thomas. And there is also that amazing story of the disciples going fishing and seeing Jesus by the shore. Certainly there is a shared conviction that the tomb was empty. There is certainly no evidence of the creation of a shrine, which would have been the case had Jesus' body still laid in the tomb. But all sorts of other traditions emerged, including the importance of Sunday as the Lord's Day, rather than the Jewish Sabbath, the Saturday. And the church in every century has spoken of Jesus as its living Lord, here and now. We have never been the Jesus of Nazareth Memorial Society, meeting to remember someone who is no longer with us. We proclaim the Lord is here. In fact, all this, the church, 2,000 years of tradition, the testimonies of billions of people, it only makes sense if Jesus rose from the dead. The theoretical physicist, theologian and Anglican priest, John Polkinghorn, who died last year, said simply, Christianity would not have come into being without the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, he said, if we cannot make the claim Jesus lives, the ambiguity of his death remains an unsolved enigma, and the significance of his life and message seem at most a brave gesture in a hostile world. But Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. Death has been defeated. Evil has been destroyed. And the life and message of Jesus is so much more, so much more than just a brave gesture in a hostile world. And that changes everything. That means that things that are precious to God, that we who are precious to God will not perish. For if God is God, then he would not willingly destroy that which is precious to him. It means love is immortal and life is eternal and goodness is not just a relative term but refers to something essential to the character of a God who reigns forever. It means that hope is something more than mere optimism. Hope is founded and guaranteed by the activity of a God whose purposes will be fulfilled and whose justice will be established. And you know what that means. It means that we should go on trying to do the right thing, trying to be a good person, trying to make the world a better place, because everything we have done and everything we will go on to do amounts to so much more than just brave gestures in a hostile world. We are an Easter people and our actions, however small, are the actions of those who, because Jesus was raised from the dead, know that good is stronger than evil. We know that love, perfect love, can drive out fear. We know that life is unendingly precious and infinitely valuable. We are an Easter people and our actions therefore bear witness to our Easter faith, that far from being just brave gestures in a hostile world, they are hints of the new reality, the new kingdom that God is ushering into being. They are demonstrations of God's unending love for his creation. They are signs that the best is yet to come and that the good for which we long will become a lasting reality. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.